Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. This is Chris Lights Out Lytle, and this is our journey to document the history of mixed martial arts. I have brought with me my friend, the MMA detective Mike Davis, and together we will preserve the history and hear some great stories from the world in the era of the no holds barred. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out Podcast. I am the MMA detective, Mike Davis, along with us today, a legend within a Midwest fighting circuit, Mike Rogers. Thanks for joining us, brother. St. Louis was like a pretty rugged little hotbed of mixed martial arts in like the mid 90s. Why don't we talk about like you growing up, your relationship with Steve Berger and just how things were? Um, yeah, he, Steve was my neighbor and um, he was the one that was really into fighting. I wasn't, I was, a, I wrestled, so I wasn't really into fighting. He was into like Chuck Norris and and John Claude Van Damme, and he took karate, and his dad used to take him to boxing and, and all that stuff. And I just did wrestling. Uh, I guess I got into wrestling because I thought pro wrestling was cool, but it was nothing like it when I got into it, but I liked it. So <laughs> so I kept doing it. And uh, so I guess I wrestled in college, and Steve started doing jujitsu at Rodrigo Vaghi's gym, which was, you know, at the time you had to look up in the yellow pages trying to find uh you know there was no internet so uh, he found him in the yellow pages he said hey whenever you get out of uh wrestling i gotta take you up to this this place and so we started doing jujitsu and it was just a pure jujitsu gym and it really still is just a pure jujitsu gym um so and that's how i got started just pretty much followed steve into it because i didn't really you know once i got out of college i didn't really have any aspirations of wrestling anymore or anything so so steve berger you know for those of you that don't know if you look at his record you're looking at something that's about 500 but when you look at the type of like quality of opponent it's mind-boggling the type the the caliber of people that steve fought yeah yeah he did and he didn't really have a we didn't really have a gym to train out of either it wasn't like uh we had a a mma gym it was mostly just uh we had a jiu-jitsu gym and then we went to a boxing gym called North County Boxing, and he never even wrestled. He didn't do anything. All he did was boxing and jujitsu. So, and then he'd try and put them together at one time. And, you know, he didn't really even spar MMA rounds. So, okay. Ever. What about street fighting? You know, it's kind of, you get her yeah. some legendary stories with you and Steve. And I think he was really, actually, all that stuff was all Steve. Steve was more interested in all that. And he, he, uh, you know, we'd go out and probably shouldn't have gone out as much as we did. And he would get into fights and I'd usually be pulling him off of people. I, I didn't get into, I, I was big, you know, I was always big. So people weren't really trying to fight me anyway. So I, my personality really isn't to, I mean, I've been in plenty of fights, but, but nothing like Steve, Steve was definitely in a lot more fight. He's more game than me to fight at pretty much the drop of a hat. I think so, Another problematic thing with Steve is, is his father enjoyed that he street fought. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that, that that probably didn't help. And you know, he, uh, yeah, any, anything that uh, any little slightest uh, little uh, inclination, someone. And he wasn't big, you know. He was, he tr he wanted to be big. He used to for a while. He tried to bulk up, and he got up to like one ninety, probably at the maybe not even that big. And, uh, and that was just a bloated, you know, not healthy 190. But when he was, his normal walking around was like 70 probably. And uh, so I would say, you know, he wasn't a big guy. You know, I was like 230, somewhere in there walking around. So I, and at that time, that was much bigger. Like people are bigger now. All right. You, you've also a two-time Golden Glove. Uh, did you win Golden Glove two times and you were also yeah. an All-American wrestler? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's your pedigree. Were you open or were you novice with Golden Gloves? Both. I won the novice my first year, and then the next year I won the open. Or two okay. years ago. Two years I won into it. Was this after college or during? After college. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty it was, impressive. Yeah, it was right in the middle of, uh, you know, back then there was really not, it was different because there was no, it was, MMA was illegal in Missouri. It was mostly illegal in Illinois. And then some places like Iowa and Minnesota, there was no rules, you know, and 
So I could, and I could box amateur and fight MMA pro because there was no sanctioning of anything, you know, at least where I was at, I, I never was involved with a sanctioning body except for maybe in California. I don't even think California, because when I fought in California, it was on Indian reservation. I think maybe if I, when I fought in, in Nevada, you know, there was a, there was a, uh, sanctioning Thank body, you. but, but after other than that, there was really no sanctioning, you know, not all my fights aren't even on my shirt on. So, no. So one of the places that I, I only went one time was pops nightclub and pops yeah. night nightclub had like, they used to erect like a six foot, like dog kennel and put it on top of a boxing ring. <laughs> Did you ever yeah. fight at Pops? Yeah, I fought there either once or twice. It's funny, like, when I fought at Pops, it's funny. I I was I coached Tyron Woodley in high school's wrestling. Right. And I brought him and he was like 15. I brought him to the to my fight at Pops. <laughs> but you're not supposed to be 15 in a pop, so but they let him in, so it worked out. Yeah, and then uh like Pops, just so people at home can understand, let's just say there was a fight in the audience. They would take the people from the audience and let them square it off inside, like the. It the was a rough kettle. place. <laughs> yeah. That was a rough yeah. place. It's still, it's not quite as rough as it used to be, uh, but it was pretty rough on a regular. You know, it was it, it was it was the place that it was a uh, place that advertised it never closed. It didn't close for like ten years. Not in the morning. Nothing. No, at no time, you know, would it close. So you go in there and. Uh, and uh, get your beer or whatever at any time. So, like, it pops. Some of the fights, guys would have, like, big belt buckles on with jeans and boots. Uh, yeah, it was, it was more like a tough man contest yes. sometimes, yes. you know. <laughs> that was Randy Greenman, I think. Randy Greenman run that, ran that show. That's where he started yeah. right before RSF. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So, let's start with your, your lineage, uh, Rodrigo Vaghi. Um, yeah. Relationship with him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're still we still we're still friends, and I still uh, we still work together sometimes, and still talk. And I'm affiliated with our gym's affiliated with his gym, and yeah, everything's really good. So Rodrigo came to St. Louis. He could have went anywhere. I mean, black belt under Hicks and Gracie. He could have went anywhere, but he chose the St. Louis area. And his mom uh, had a his mom was married and had a. Uh, Rest, his, her husband had a restaurant in St. Louis. And so he came here. That's why he came here. And then and it, it closed down right away, but he stayed. The impact that he made within the Midwest, like him and Pedro Sauer, in my opinion, had the deepest impact within the Midwest mixed, early mixed martial arts scene. Yeah, I, I would say so. And uh, Pe uh, Pedro Sauer had a much bigger uh, association. Uh, I mean, he was all over the place. He still, I think he still has a huge association. I'm not sure. He does. Um, Rodrigo was, was a lot in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, so he had a, he had some gyms in Omaha and then in St. Louis. Right. That's correct. So technically speaking, because I know we've got like, dude, there's people that watch this that are the comments on YouTube are insane. Like they're very technical. Technically Rodrigo got his, Brown belt under Hickson. Hickson goes to the United States. Hoyler physically gave him his black belt, but he's under Hickson. Am I correct on that? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Good. You know, just, just, you know, so he got his, can. He had a pretty good uh, class. It was with uh, Salo and uh, another world champion. They had a, they had a pretty good class of black belts that he got his black belt with. So um, Hickson, you know, he came here and then he was teaching at Hickson's a little bit. And uh, I think uh, Hoyer, I, I know Hickson was, uh, Hickson was the champion of the family and did all the fighting and stuff. But Hoyler, to me, would have been just as, he was incredible. And I, I was a big fan of Hoyler's, too, at, the, at that time. Uh, dude, there's statues of people that have done less athletically than Hoyler yeah. Gracie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, Hoyler's a freaking stud. I mean, I think that Hoyler had to fight more. It seemed to me like, there was more videos of Hoyler fighting people because people like, I can beat that guy, you know, Smaller. but they weren't ready to fight Hickson, you know, yeah, like oh, Hickson, yeah. yeah, you know, so uh, that's what it seems like to me, you know, and Hickson, he put it on the line a lot more than Hickson did. Not that Hickson didn't put it on the line. He did, 
but uh, people were willing to fight Hoyler, and and uh, I don't know. I was always a fan of Hoyler. Oh yeah, for, yeah, yeah. For that all reason, of them, all of them, yeah. I was a fan of all of them, especially back then. You know, I was a fan of every Gracie guy. Didn't matter. You know the 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 uh, Gracie. Um, lineage carlos carlson gracie you know his team and then brazilian top team there i was a big fan of those guys too uh senior in my opinion doesn't get enough credit carlson gracie senior um yeah. he you know, was taking kids off the street without an idea that one day these guys are going to be like admired athletes he was just doing it to keep them out of trouble and create a badass fight team yeah and they um I know he got beat. I mean, uh, Alio got beat by some, by a guy. I forgot the guy. One of his old students, and Carlson came back and beat him. You know, back in back those days, it was a little different. It was a lot different in Brazil. You know, obviously, although Brazil is probably a lot the same now. I, I really don't know, but I know I know Alio had gotten beaten by one of his uh, st- his former students, and Carlson challenged him and and beat him. Well, in our interview with Draculino. In essence, he said he did not sugarcoat it. He said jujitsu was like gangs and gang activity, and there was criminal stuff taking place. Yeah. And he's, he's like, it's kind of cleaned up now, but the reality of the situation is there was no money. We fought for honor, and if we saw somebody on the street, it was on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what it seemed like. You know, that's, uh, I, you know, we didn't get this. It, you know, being from St. Louis, you know, I was doing jujitsu at that time, but I wasn't involved in that. You know, I wasn't involved in any type of Brazilian. I, I went down to Brazil a couple times, but but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, an intense situation when I went down there. So, yeah. but I mean, I remember Rodrigo, uh, you know, uh, telling me he was in, um, he was in the gym at the Gracie Mai Tai, which is the original Gracie gym, I guess. And, uh, is a, but the guy that Hickson fought, was it uh, Hugo? Hugo Duarte on the beach, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, apparently that whole team came to the gym, and they were all fighting. And the police came and, were, and shot guns to, to get them to stop, like shot guns through the ceiling of the, of the gym. Like, I don't know the whole story. Maybe you can get well, him to tell well, it. But I well, Pedro Sauer actually told us that story. Uh, oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, when we interviewed Pedro, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, it's been a long time since I heard it, so I don't know the. But I know yeah. Hickson. I mean, Rodrigo was there. I, That's I, wild. I believe it was something like the guy showed up and Elio called uh, Hickson up and said, "Hey, they they want to fight and come down here," and and Hickson rode his bike to the gym or something. <laughs> I don't. know. <laughs> and they you all. Made, and it was a big, uh, huge fist fight. Imagine making that phone call. Yeah, we've got yeah. people in the gym. They're here to fight you. Just, just come on down. Let's just get this over with. Though there's a whole group of them. There's lots of them. But don't yeah. worry. Come on down. <laughs> right. Can you can you imagine like you're getting in a fight and in those days it was there was no tapping out. It was like even the in that area, you know, like these guys. Like if we get in a fight now, I see guys fighting and then they, they want to quit. Uh, they'll tap and you know on the street fight, which that I guarantee you there was no tapping out in that room. Like they're no. people with broken arms and like broken limbs you know probably no no broken feet because they didn't allow those foot locks back then but but seriously seriously injured people coming out of there yeah you know? yeah you were you were riding out on your shield whether you wanted to or not yeah <laughs> you show up you're, you're fighting this is a war you know and yeah i didn't have any i mean we had some great some challenges at our gym but they weren't serious like that they were just hey we want to well, they weren't very, if they did, they probably weren't very good. So it wasn't very intense, you know, on our, on my end, at least. Yeah. But there's also some honor in that, like showing up at a group with the gym, rather than just beating everybody up without the person there. They're like, no, no, no. We're here for one person. Yeah. I, mean, what is, I can't imagine a negotiating process. All right. Let's right. not fuck all of us up. Let's just get the person here and settle it. Okay. Right. Okay? <laughs> yeah. And that happened also in, uh, in, Ca- in California at Hickson's gym, when the guy, the uh, Japanese, um, and Hickson hasn't ever released the, the video of it. And, and, and Rodrigo wasn't there for this, I don't believe, but, but uh, a Japanese fighter came with a, with a huge group of, uh, of reporters and challenged Hickson at his gym in California. 
So it had been probably early 2000s, probably, or late 90s. And uh, Hickson said, okay, you come in here, I'll film it. And, but none of your reporters get to come in. And he, he, he beat him up, and he has the video and has never released it. So I don't know. It's Hopefully kind someday of, will. Yeah, it's uh, Ken Shamrock has done that several times, including one with Mark Coleman. It's just closed-door matches, man. No one's allowed in here except the people involved. And, yeah. man. I was never players. really involved in, in one, you know, like that. Nothing that serious at all. But uh, – if somebody, some like you know, somebody would come in like, oh yeah, I know like all these moves, and I'm gonna roll, and and they and they would you know want to fight, but they just weren't, you know, they weren't really fighters. They were, they weren't really trained, and so it wasn't like an intense thing. You know, I that one guy bit me one time, and so I choked him. I think I choked him out. I, I don't remember. It's been so many years. It's been twenty years. Yeah. So, Rodrigo probably tells us. I seen Rodrigo laughing when he bit me, and uh, but you know, well, it wasn't, it's, never, it's it's NHB. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it was more jujitsu, I, I think, than punching. You know, so <laughs> let's start with your first documented fight. Obviously, not your actual first fight. April twenty eighth, nineteen ninety eight, submission fighting championship. Richard Dodd. Do I don't remember, remember it really. I remember a little bit. I probably arm barred him, I'm guessing. Yes. I, um, yeah. So yeah. How much how much training did you have prior to that fight? Um I probably didn't have I mean I wrestled, so I had wrestling and jujitsu, and I don't know if I had what year was that? It was nineteen ninety eight. Yeah, so I had just started boxing. So not I, I didn't really box much in any of my fights, so so I I figured you know, the goal was always to take them down. It wasn't like, like today when I, I didn't really have a chance to, I didn't have anybody, any guidance like, Hey, you know, you should do this and you might make it to the UFC. There was time. There was probably like two, two UFCs a year or something. And I didn't have any, any like idea of how to get in touch with anybody or, or even the, I didn't, I don't even think I had the, uh, it wasn't something that it wasn't UFC wasn't big like it is now. It wasn't like something. Oh yeah, I need to get in UFC. Oh, uh, it was you know, a dark uh, secret. Like your yeah. your, par- your parents asked you not to talk about it at parties because <laughs> it was so. I mean, it was so shocking. Yeah. UFC was definitely it. It pulled the head pretty quickly, but at the time it was UFC and then Extreme Challenge, and then there was another one that I believe that uh, Half Gracie fought on. It was a pretty big one. I think Conan Silveira fought on it too. And then hook and shoot. You're talking about Battle Kid. Okay. Probably. Yeah. yeah was bit. So do you remember the promoter Brian Madden? Yeah, very well. I was I was very close with Brian. Yeah, I love I love Brian. Yeah, He's so Brian great. a like bodybuilder, pro wrestler, had his own gym, um, and was also the promoter of that event. He, he was um, a member of the Killer Bees. He was a member of the Killer Bees. You're right, you know the third yeah. guy. Yeah, I did. I did actually. Yeah. 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 And his and he was uh, with with uh, Brutus Beefcake. Yeah. Right. That was the other guy. I think that was the other guy who was who was related to Dick the Bruiser. So that was a you know, not the, but Brian was like one of the first guys to put shows on. He, if he wouldn't have passed away, he probably would have been, you know, one of the big promoters. You know. Yeah, Madden, uh, interesting guy as well. Like he, uh, you know, if you're from pro wrestling and you know your tag team partners jump in Jim Brunzel and B Brian Blair, you've probably been around a few blocks. Yeah, yeah. He he was yeah. He he was definitely he was always smiling, always happy, and always wanted to help. Always doing everything, like always hanging, calling up to hang out with us, you know. And me and Steve Berger, and you know Todd Fox. I don't know if do you know Todd Fox is. I, I I seen him fight like once or twice way yeah. back in the day. Yeah. He he's actually a huge uh he actually has a huge uh, company and he uh runs right now he's running security for for uh for the uh, I believe Roger Waters. And he does oh, wow. security for uh the Eagles tool. Um he started with Madonna. You know, he's had he's got some big clients. So wow good for him. yeah and he had a pretty good fight record fought some pretty tough guys too 
For sure, for sure. Well, your second documented bout is a four-man tournament with Universal uh, Challenge Championship. I that, that, that was just in our gym. <laughs> okay, because that I don't know who the promoter was. That was no punches to the head, open hand punches to the face. Well, you win by your third arm bar in a row with Wayne Pittman and Mike Leake. I mean, you started with yeah. Richard Dodd. So, like, you obviously know that move. <laughs> yeah, they were just local. They were local. They are, they still are local guys. And still, I think both those guys still train jujitsu under, uh, actually, they're in the Hoyler, Gracie. They're, they're both under JW Wright. Both of them. I think they both have black belts now, too. Mike Leake and uh, Wayne Pittman. That's wild. That's wild. Yeah. And here in the Midwest, it's not like California. Like, you've got to fight a lot. You bring your lunch to work. You know, in California, like kind of those West Coast fighters, you get five, six fights, you're in the UFC. Like, there was always kind of catering. Yeah. But in the Midwest, there were some, like, legitimate, very difficult people that didn't have great records because they always fought t- tough competition. And one of which was Rob Smith, who you fought on Brian Madden's yeah. event. Rob Smith, I mean, just so everybody knows, fought Rampage Jackson and got robbed of a decision. He absolutely won their fight. Yeah. Yeah, he was, I think he was from Wisconsin. Yes, still right? is. Trains yeah. with Mark, currently training with Mark Lehman, I might add. Okay, yeah. Um, I really don't remember. I don't remember all these fights. It's been so long. I don't, you know, it's, uh, was that, what, what year was that? Like That was, like, uh. No, April 28th, 2000. And 2000. I'll, I'll even push it forward. I was at this fight. And I think yeah. if I, my memory serves me properly, Adrian Serrano was in his corner. Right. Yeah. He was with Adrian Serrano. Yep. Who's another? He's a, definitely a pioneer. He did a ton of fights, Adrian Serrano. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah. We'll, we'll have Adrian on one day. But if you look at Rob Smith at this moment, he loses, gets robbed of his decision to Rampage, loses his a decision to you and in his next fight he gets knocked out by rich franklin <laughs> yeah 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 so he he had a thought you know if you weren't you know it, any of us that were smart if we were any of us were smart we would have went up there with militich and with monty cox if we had any brain and we wanted to get anywhere in mma they had it going on they're the best obviously the best coach and the best uh manager in the game so if we would have had a brain, yeah. if we would have had a brain, if I had, if I wanted to really go far, I I would have went up there, and I I think I would have definitely done a, had a better career. But you know they they're the only ones that had it really going on in the Midwest at the time. At the time, for yeah. sure. Yeah, and I think it was just because Monty was able to travel uh, and make the connections, and he socialized very well, hundred percent. Oh, yeah, yeah, he 100%. had it. He had it with, uh, you know, the other. The other guy that had a good connection with UFC was uh, Jeff from Hook and Shoot. Um, Jeff Osborne. Jeff Osborne, big time. Like, he he did a good job with that, too. But, you know, he didn't have a gym. He just had the connections there. And and uh, I remember going up to Hook and Shoot, and um, why, why can't I think of the, the original matchmaker's name? From uh, Miguel Odorate. No, no, the second one, then. The uh the one that just retired a couple years ago. Oh, are you talking about Joe Silva? Joe Silva, what's wrong with me? Yeah. yeah so okay. I, we ate lunch with Joe Silva. He was just out watching hook and shoot with uh Jeff. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. In in, in fact, uh who can shoot Jeff? I mean, the UFC used to kind of make matches based on what took place place in Hook and Shoot. Who can shoot is in Evansville, Indiana. It's I don't know, maybe seven hours from Chicago. Very difficult to get there by airplane or traveling. And the influence it had on the UFC at a very early stage is something that's pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah, they 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 had some good fighters coming out of there. Eve Edwards and and uh, Aaron Riley, Riley. Yeah. Dee Berger. Um, probably, I don't know. I mean, the other one was Extreme Challenge, but they had all the was an extreme. That had Monty Cox did. That's yeah, with Monty Cox. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, another fight here, Mike Brown, Hermes Franca. That's a hook and shoot fight. Like yeah. that's that's an actual hook and shoot fight. Like that's yeah, you know, incredible. Um one of the things I was not at this fight, but I heard all about it. August 23rd, 2000, you fight Mike Delaney. 
Do yeah. you remember that fight specifically? I remember. I I think I armbarred him. You know. You know these fights. You know, back in the day, it was like going to a wrestling match because it wasn't like it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't on TV. What there was no internet. Just your friends would come and watch you if it was in St. Louis, and that would be the it. That would be it. You know, you know, I did, it wasn't like a, it was a big, it was a big deal, but it wasn't like today where, you know, there's a huge training camp and, you know, all these social media and following. Yeah, it and, wasn't like the same. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I do remember fighting him. Yep. Okay. Do you remember what took place with Steve Berger at that fight? I don't. <laughs> so Steve Berger's opponent left after weigh-ins. Oh. Yeah. And you guys were scrambling for an opponent, and Mike Delaney's corner agreed to fight Steve Berger in the main event. Oh, yeah, who was it? I don't even remember. Okay, so Steve, his name was Brian Garrity. He was drunk. Okay, I remember him. Yeah, he definitely. was drunk, <laughs> and he said, well, I was drinking, and uh, they came at me with 200 bucks to fight in the main event, right. and I didn't even know anything but I knew that 200 bucks was going to be sweet. So, <laughs> so it was a said, different time, man. Like I said, it's said, way different. He said that, yeah, Rogers came over, you know, we're, you know, we're ready to fight, but you know, he came over with the promoter and, you know, they kind of worked a deal and yeah, man, he was like, I didn't even know who Steve Berger was. And it was, you know, now I feel like I could have got more money out of it, but you know, at the time, <laughs> 200 bucks was nice. Yeah. That is funny. There's a lot of fights like that, you know, that just match them up. There's no, you know, there was no real rules, you know, they could make up the rules that they wanted, you know, it was in a ring. You know, at Hook and shoot was that always in a ring. There was no, nobody had a cage in the Midwest. I think, I think Monty Cox got one. Well, at this time it was all kennels. It was all dog kennels. Right. So, I mean, Monty didn't have a cage until about like early, like maybe th 2003, 2004. But yeah. like he was, they were all doing a dog kennel thing, like yeah. just that that rebar. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was definitely a, it was for sure a different time. But it was fun, you know, and everybody was drinking, you know. It, it was in, it was a different time. We weren't concerned about being healthy or, you know, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, you know, it was, you know, what's the game plan? Well, this guy can punch, so let's take him down, or you know. Or I'm just gonna, you know, with Steve, it was always, it was always no game plan. Just go out there and slug the whole time, and not, you know, see what happens. Who's the tougher guy? Well, so we I mean, and let's even push this further. At this time, everybody was a one-trick pony. It was like, yeah, well, he's right. a wrestler, he's a boxer, he's a jujitsu guy. Meanwhile, the tools you're bringing in, Gold Glove boxer. <laughs> oh, excuse me. You know, uh, jujitsu. Obviously, you're 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 proficient at jujitsu, and um, you know you've got a lot more tools than about ninety yeah. percent of the the field at this point. Yeah, I, I always felt pretty. I was never. I always felt like I was. I should have won all my fights. I I don't think that I should have lost any of my fights that I lost. It. Um, it was lack of training, but my skill set was probably as, yeah. as good. And and uh, I wasn't as willing to like. I should have let my hands go more, but uh, the game plan was always to take him down, you know, because Rodrigo's like, oh, you take him down, buddy, and you break his arm, you know, and I should have done more, you know, and, and I never I never did even did one MMA practice in my entire, you know, there was either I went to boxing or jujitsu or, uh, or wrestling practice. It was just. It, it, but it, it didn't exist. Like it, no, there it, was, the well, one-stop gym just didn't exist at this time. Militich had it. Other than Pat. Well, Pat kind of created it on his own, but right. he learned jujitsu on his own. It wasn't like he brought in a black belt. It wasn't no. like he brought in like a professional boxer. It no, was, yeah. he perfected his tools and opened up his own gym. Yeah. I think like he did, and that probably like, uh, probably Sor uh, Serrano probably had yeah. a, a made type of gym. Um, and then the rest would probably be that, that were would have been all MMA gyms would have just been garage gyms, you know, like a couple of guys getting together and training for MMA. Scrounging up some wrestling mats, throw them in a yeah. garage. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's pretty wild. So Brian Garrity goes on to the ultimate fighter, you know, fights in the UFC a couple of times. And um, 
No, fantastic human being. We have an interview with him where he runs through it and he's like, yeah, the next day I'm in the limo and I'm hearing Madden talk on the phone saying, yeah, I really did burger or salad because I owed him one. And he's like, as soon as he got the phone, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in the back of the car right here. You, you don't have to say that in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bad, that was a Madden fight, huh? Yeah. 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 When he was on a Madden fight. Yep. All right. So let, let's talk about some of your students. Um, in the past, obviously, you've got you've coached some people that have fought at very high levels. Will Brooks being one of them, and early Will Brooks. I didn't. I don't think I, I didn't coach Will Brooks. You did not. I did not. I can give you a list of the guys that I coached. Here, I got Ty, I got Tyrone Woodley, yeah. Josh Sampo, Lance Benoist, and Matt Richhouse. Matt Ricehouse. Ricehouse. I, apo- yeah. I apologize. Matt Ricehouse. Those are like the early group of guys. I yeah. Got. Well, the first group was Tyron. And then Lance and uh, Sampo, Alp Oskolich fought in the UFC, mm-hmm. Andrew, Andrew Sanchez, uh, Luis Pena, uh, Charles Johnson's in the UFC now. Uh, let's see, in Bellator was EJ Brooks and uh, Zach Freeman and uh, Julius Anglicus. And Gliskis, um, they they all had contra, and then Matt Rysos was a was with Strike Force. So, so they all it, they've all either made they all had contracts with UFC or with Bellator or or Strike Force. Right. So in essence, the reason you're here is because your long, rich history of not only yourself but the people that you've passed your knowledge on to. Let's talk about an early Tyron Woodley from high school. What yeah, was he was impression of him. He was always he was always quiet, and uh, until you get to know him, he, he's pretty quiet. And uh, he worked his he worked his ass off. And then um, I would say that I was probably I, I I got him there his junior year and his senior year. Uh, he didn't place as a sophomore, and then his junior year he got second. He he lost to a three time state champion, and uh, they actually split. They he wrestled him four times that year, and he. He lost to him in a dual meet and then beat him at districts and sectionals and then lost to him in the finals of state. And then his senior year, he went undefeated and won one state. And, uh, and, uh, I got him with another guy named Chris Whalen, who's kind of a, you know, in the summertime to coach him. And he, and he brought him up quite a bit between mostly after his senior year. And, uh, he, I think he placed seventh in nationals that year and then fourth and, and uh, freestyle nationals and he got a offer to wrestle at nebraska and he he was going to go to nebraska and then the coach got the coach left so he decided to go to missouri and uh oh, wow so then he wrestled at missouri and then when he got out of got out of college he came back and and started training to fight and so he stayed with me till his ninth fight i believe his ninth pro fight right, right. he wanted to own gym and kind of you know, it was kind of too close to our gym, so he went on his own. Mm-hmm. Have, really, uh, have you guys spoken at any yeah, point recently? Yeah, well, I see him and stuff, we still talk, and, you know, probably I should have handled it better, and uh, things would have been better, but that's the way it is now. So we're still friends. If we see each other, we're friends and friendly, and, you know, it's it's great that he went as far as he did. So... Hundred percent. And if you uh, see Tyrone Woodley today, as compared to when he was fighting in the UFC, from what I was told, he had a uh, an experience in like with ayahuasca, and he they say that he is just at peace with himself. Is he? Well, That's I, a- I guess I haven't. He he he. A couple of years ago, uh, he called me up, and we went out to lunch, and and then every now and then I would see him at like tournaments and stuff with his son, you know, I'd be at a tournament that his son would be at, you know, his son was wrestled and now his son plays football at a, in, in Texas, I believe. Uh, the one time I saw Tyron fight like regionally, I just remember his mom in the audience. Yeah. I mean, you could hear her from anywhere in the building. Yeah. That's how loud she was. <laughs> like that in high school. Like she would come and, and everywhere at state. She's like, 
you know what I like, you know, you know, that's what she would always yell. She was always, and you know, she would take care of all those kids on the whole team. Like in, in high school, she was kind of like the general mom of all the kids that were Tyron's friends. You know, they would, they all kind of looked to her, looked up. I mean, not that they didn't have moms themselves, but she was kind of like the team the mom. mom, the team yeah. mom, man. Yeah. I, I, like I said, I've only seen Tyron fight one time and I went out of my way to introduce myself to his mom that night. Because yeah. she's just so, just a, a big personality and a yeah, uh, beautiful sure. human being, for sure. For sure. Um, you know, she, you get, actually, uh, she adopted kids and had people staying with her. Like, it wasn't like just the wrestlers, too. Like, there were some other kids that would, that she took care of as well. Right. So, yeah. 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 I'm a beautiful human being. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about Josh Sampo. Mm-hmm. Josh uh, wrestled at Lindenwood, which is right down the street from our first gym. And he came in and I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do this. And, and uh, he, he did, he had a great career with me. And then uh, when he made this, like everybody, all the guys, once they made it to the UFC, they, you know, he decided to go to, he moved to California with uh, Jason house. And, and so I didn't have a lot to do with it. I got, you know, I got to fight in his first, I got the, I, I got to corner him still, but I got to train him for only his first UFC fight. And uh, he won fight of the night and submission of the night. Uh, but then he, when he left, he, you know, I did. I mean, that's the, that's the story with all of them. Some, when the, when they, they all left, when they, when they made the UFC, all my I mean, UFC fighters. They get hypnotized. And what's yeah. strange is like, like we, we, the reoccurring theme in our podcast when talking to people such as yourself, the reality of the situation is, is fighters generally are not loyal, but there's really only two types of, of coaches. There's your guy that brings you up from white belt from beginning to end, you know, gets you, you know, to the highest level that they can. And then there's big game hunters, poachers, people yeah. that just, you know, they don't really want to put the work in, in the beginning, but they're going to take somebody already developed and they might not have the skill set or ability to teach beginners but once somebody is already advanced, they can kind of help them work around. Like, Mike, you're a coach. You're a coach. You're not a poacher. Well, yeah, I haven't. I haven't been able to poach anybody yet. Not that if anybody was really good, wanted to come. If you want to come to our gym and you're really good already, that'd be great. We'll take and, it. And <laughs> both are necessary. I mean, and don't, I, don't, don't think- I don't go out and yeah, no. I don't go out and try and get people. You know, it's my. I'm a. I'm a coach. It's my gym, and I have a lot. I don't make the money off the fighters really. So do. You know, uh, that's been the uh, – Julius Inglickus has been trained with me, and he has never – he's got opportunities to leave. I've even asked him a couple times, like, hey, you know, maybe go get a look down at uh, Kill Cliff. I really like the guys down there. Or, you know, and he just kind of doesn't want to. So, um, but, uh, you know, and but I've – he had he got himself a pretty good contract, and it's been kind of nice – getting paid, you know, for fighters rather than spending money on trips. And then they leave to go to the UFC. And um, although that's not the, that's not the case with Sampo. He paid me. He continued to pay me after he left. You and know, so, so Al Bolskowitz, you know, there wasn't like, I think they felt like at our gym, they weren't going to, I know a lot of managers also get in your ear like, Hey, you need to come out to Vegas. You need to come out to, to get the really good training. And uh, that's what most of them have done. And, and uh, some of it's worked and some of them it hasn't. But uh, guys like uh, Sampo, he left, but he continued to write me a check after he left. You know, was, man, there's some honorable there. And uh, he, I, I didn't I didn't have any uh, – and he's back. You know, he's back in St. Louis. And my son, uh, once he, he's our head wrestling coach at a local high school. My son's like, I want to go there, you know. That's where I want to go because Sampo's there. So, I mean, we yeah. have a great relationship still. It's That's just, it. uh, you know – he made that decision for his career and I get, and I understand it because, you know, you only get one chance. It was, it's kind of a bummer, but that's the way it is. And the same thing with uh, Al, you know, he never, he was not a St. Louis guy. He's from Istanbul. So, and, uh, but he won five of the night as well in UFC. Right. Well, with, with sample also, when you leave, you try to leave with the door open, not closed. Yeah. Yeah. He can't. Yeah. He left with the door open. That's all you can ask. Everyone, right? everyone pretty much did, except for maybe Luis Pena. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, everybody else pretty much did. 
Well, Josh Sample and his fight record. Um, you were in his corner when he fought uh, Alexi Vila. Yeah, Alexis Vila. Yeah, that was a great. That was incredible. You know, he he was he wasn't supposed to win, and he was he was down on the cards and submitted him in the fifth round. It was it was unbelievable. Actually, it was one of the best. So- times. For those of you guys that don't know, Alexis Vila is the person that uh, Jorge Masvidal is always saying, free Alexis. He, Cuban national wrestling champion, Olympic wrestler from Cuba, and uh, he went crazy a couple times. I think he drove his car onto the uh, runway of the Miami airport, and then shortly (laughs) after got arrested for murder. Um, But Alexis Vila, yeah. Oh, he's still in prison. Yeah, he's still in jail. That sounds Um, like it. Yeah, but 100% great A athlete out of American Top Team, Hector Lombard, when we interviewed him, he said, don't let that guy's size fool you. He runs shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a beast. And he, I think he was a little older, too, when he fought Sampo. But, you don't uh, know how old Cubans ever are. You really yeah. don't know. Yeah. Well, And also, you know, at that time, there was re- I think there wasn't a 125-pound weight class. It maybe had just started. You know, it had been there for like a year, maybe, you know, so there was, it was, you know, everything was up in the air with Sampo. Like, are, is he going to be able to fight in the UFC or we're going to try and get something in Japan or you know, one of these other shows. And then, and then they, then they, they came out with the 125 pound weight class, but they weren't, it wasn't like there was a lot of guys in the weight class, you know, at, at that time. And yeah. Alexi was in the UFC, which he was a, on you know, he was the number one ranked guy on the, a lot of the, you know, the mate, fight matrix and stuff. hundred percent. Yeah. He was probably the you know, number one guy in the entire world at 125 based on his pedigree. Yeah. And yeah. him coming from American top team, you knew he had, you know, right. the best coaches just like he did in Cuba. Yeah. Um, another fighter that sample beat with you in the corner was Banuelos, Antonio Banuelos. Yeah. Yep. I'll beat him too. Um, yeah, that was on LFA before it, it merged with uh, with RFA, right? Or I, I think it was, it was R, RFA and it was LFA. Legacy. It was on LFA uh, with Mick Maynard owned it before yeah. uh, before it had merged, and now LFA, you know, it's the biggest you know show on on the uh, UFC TV fight pass. Yeah, yeah, fight pass. So, um. Yeah, that was a, that was a great fight. That one I remember. It was that was a lot of fun because it was a big deal to me. You know that big that show was a big deal to me, and uh, we had a lot of fun with it. You know he he uh, sample broke his hand, so we had to we had to go to the hospital afterwards. I remember that he he won it handily. It was a good fight. Yeah, and Banuelos at the time was also top five in the world. So sample really made a name for himself on the independent grind. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, and it was it was nearly impossible to get him on the USC, and uh, uh, when they it was did Japan call or him bust, up, it was like Japan or bust at that time, correct? Yeah. Well, he got he got into the USC, and they, what they did was they called him up on. He had three days notice. He weighed one fifty two. <laughs> he had three days notice. It was the middle of wrestling season, so he was he was coaching wrestling, and they're like, "You want to get? You want to fight? You know, if you can make weight." Then we'll do it. And he missed weight by he missed weight by a pound. Oh. From one he went he cut from one fifty two, and he weighed one twenty seven instead of one fight of the night that night. Correct? Yeah, yeah. he, he would have got but, submission the night, and he didn't get. And instead of getting uh, any bonus, the other guy got the whole bonus, even though he wanted to fight. You know, because he didn't make weight, so yeah. the other kid won the whole won the whole bonus. I mean, you didn't talk to Dana or Joe Silva at the time saying, man, he took it on three days notice. There was no they negotiation. Basically said that they didn't. Well, it was uh, Sean Shelby did 125. Okay. Joe okay. Silva was still a matchmaker, but he didn't do the 25 pounders. And he's like, basically, you got to make weight. That's doesn't matter. You know, if it's two days notice or one day notice, if you don't make weight, then you don't make weight. <laughs> so that was a bummer for me because I would have got a percentage of that. Yeah, it would have been think- nice. <laughs> It would have been nice. I don't remember which it was, but it would have been great, actually. You got your basement done, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, April 28th, 1998, submission fighting championships. Or, I apologize. Wait, 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 wait. October 6th, 2000, reality submission fighting. 
Let's talk about uh, promoter Randy Greenman. Yeah. Randy was a local guy. He trained a lot and he was into martial arts. And then he also uh, had uh, made money on the side doing uh, selling things. And uh, I think he needed to, I think he needed to, he was using that money to, to run his, his fight shows. So he's paying everybody a lot of money. And are you talking like multi-level marketing or are we talking? Yeah. 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 Well, he said (laughs) at the time he said he only sold marijuana, but I don't know what, I don't know. You know, we weren't friends like that, you know, but he ended up being, he was murdered, you know, so he was murdered uh, in that business. So, but I mean, I always liked him. I mean, (laughs) he was a good friend of mine, but, but uh, on that level, we weren't really, we didn't do business like that together, but he, he, he actually, he had, he had made so much money that I was supposed to fight Dan Severn on his card. And, uh, the way we, we went to the weigh-in and then Dan didn't show up to the fight and he paid me my, I think he paid me three grand for not even for, for not even fight. Yeah. So Randy Greenman was bigger than life. He was, he was every huge. bit of 400 pounds at least. Yeah. And his girlfriend at the time, uh, I think her boobs would enter the room about like 15 seconds before she got there. Yeah. So, so yeah, like he, he was a wild guy. He was yeah. a wild guy. Yeah, he was a wild guy. He had two, and he had two different, you know, he had two different, he lived two different lives too. You know, he had this life that, that, uh, with the MMA group and everything. And then he had his life on the side and doing what he did on the side. So he was two different people. Well, let, let me quantify his second life so this event the main event um is caro parisian versus sean shirk and steve Berger fought shoney carter and you fought ron rump so the amount of payroll needed to create an event like this because he paid more than the ufc like he outpaid the ufc and there was no easy way of getting you know to where he was at like it was very difficult to get there yeah yeah i mean they had some great fights also i another fight that they had on there was chris lottle versus caro parisian and i i refereed that fight but that was later on you know it, that was, was, it was on that show though it, it was, was on, on that show it was on randy's show it was on randy's show correct oh yeah i mean you had pete spratt chris lytle i mean it were it's just on and yeah. on and on yeah no, jeremy sure. horn Jeremy Horn, Manny Gamburian fought on it yep. as well. Um, and, they had a, and then uh, Travis Fulton fought a guy. I refereed that one too. And I can't remember his name. He was Caro's, uh, he was Caro, Caro's teammate with Goker. But I can't think of his name. He was also, he was kind of like the guy that everybody said was the, he never fought in the UFC. He just fought on these local shows, but he was from Vegas too. You can look it up on tra- who, who fought Travis, but it would take you a long time to go through the, the names there. Um, yes. And so Randy Greenman essentially would wash his money through his shows. That's and right. I will tell you what, it was the greatest time of my life in regard in terms of like regional mixed yeah. martial arts. I, yeah. I mean, we needed more. We needed more. Yeah. It would have been, he would have, you know, you know, he, he was, he overlapped Madden a little bit, but not much. And, uh, you know, Madden died. He had a, he had a, uh, I think from, he had a heart attack. heart attack from, he had asthma. And, uh, okay. so he, that, that causes heart attack, I believe. But then, you know, Randy took over in St. Louis and, and, uh, always did in the Illinois because we we're in St. Louis was on the border of Illinois and Missouri. It was illegal to do them. And, Illinois, there was no rules, I don't believe, as no. far as what, what you could do. The person you were thinking of with Travis Fulton, was it Roman uh, Theresian? I think I, so. I, that's a guess on my end. I don't know, but he yeah, was but kind That's of, not his first name, but his last might be his last name. Theresian. So that it was kind of like the big three out of Goker's camp. Yeah. Manville, Caro, and then uh, that are, the other guy, who was yeah. a be- unbelievable beast. So uh, Steve Berger used to hang out with Randy all the time. And yeah. when you know, Randy went missing, there was also a person with him that had absolutely nothing to do with what Randy was involved with. Like that could have been anybody that could have yeah. been anybody. 
Well, the guy, I think the guy also would go along with him to keep him. He was Bodyguard. a big guy as well. Yeah. And the and the guy that murdered him was a friend of his. He was actually the best man in his wedding. So, and the and the guy snuck up to him, snuck up behind him with a twenty two, oh. shot him in the head, and then burnt the house. They burnt the house down. You know, afterwards, and then they they had uh, dismembered the body and and put him all over St. Louis, like parts of in uh, West Alton and down in Festus, and yeah, it was a local biker group yeah so in essence like what i was told was uh this guy takes the hit doesn't tell on anybody goes to prison and uh gives all the contacts over to randy and randy did what he was supposed to do put the money on his books gave people what it is they were supposed to get and when this guy got out he said okay you're done i'm taking my business back now and randy said well wait a minute he gave it to me this big and now i made it that big and i've got new contacts in costa rica at which point uh, the negotiations went south. That, that might be true. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I wasn't that familiar with it. I, I only know a DEA agent told me about, they used to train with me, you know, told me what happened because they didn't know what happened either until they, they had caught a guy and he had flipped on the whoever. And, on the bikers, yeah. yeah. But I don't, I don't know. That, 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 that sounds like something that could have happened. You know, or that, or maybe they just wanted to get rid of him anyway, get rid of the middleman. So right. I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, I know one of the bikers that got caught had a human skull in his fish tank at the time. Like they were going through his house searching, and they're like, you know, that ornament in there does not look like it's store bought. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I didn't hear any of that stuff. Yeah. But that, oh yeah, I did my research. Like that, <laughs> yeah and, and you know i mean it's just i mean what an, uh, an amazing human being no we're gonna we're gonna put this let the fish swim in and out of it like what the fuck yeah <laughs> yeah these these are you know I, I don't have any contact with them or know them so i you know, even steve, <laughs> steve didn't either you know I, I mean i hung out with randy like steve did and and uh, we didn't have any we didn't have any contact with that side of him or any of those dealings you know, it's fine. We, we train with police officers and they raided his house and then, and they're, and they're raiding his house and they're walking through the halls. And he looks over and he sees a picture of me and Rodrigo and Steve with him on the wall. And he's like, what the hell, <laughs> you know, because he had trained with us, you know, and then they see a, he, when he goes in there, he sees a picture of us on the wall, you know, when he's, a, when he's, a, he, when he's raiding that, uh, Randy's house, <laughs> he was on the SWAT team. So that was kind of a funny story. You know, you know, so, man, I miss the guy. You know, I, yeah, I, whatever. I, I, I do too. He was supposed to do a private with me and didn't show up. And that was when he got murdered. You know, he was coming out to do a private. He was getting back into it. Did, did you, uh, do you remember getting the phone calls in regards to like the frantic phone calls from his loved ones in regards to have you seen them? Have you talked to him? Nobody, nobody called me. I got a few of those. Yeah, I got a few of those. Yeah. Yeah. Because he and I used to talk. A few times a week, just he was a big highest end guy, and um, I dude, I would just he was the one guy that was nerdier than me with MMA. And, he was so fanny man. He was such a fan of everybody. Yeah. That's why he spent yeah. the money. He brought in people he wanted to see fight. You know, he brought. That's why he was a huge Goker fan. He was the he, biggest Goker fan in the in the world, probably. And Gambirian too. He loved Monville. Uh, uh, Goker was the coach, right? Yeah, Goker was a yeah, coach. So him, Goker Judo, Gene LeBeau. Guy. Yeah. He would bring him in for seminars. I mean, he was – but anybody that was connect, connected to Goker, he was – They got first be, pick. Yeah. Yeah, they, he was going to be their fan. And he'd get, he'd get them uh, limousines when they came in town. And, uh, yeah, they they had a good time. You know, we weren't into – Steve and I weren't into drugs. We didn't do yeah. – we weren't into drugs at all. So we didn't have – that was a separate thing. We didn't go hang out with those guys, you know, but, uh, yeah. So, but yeah, he was definitely, you know, there's, I would have to sit down and think about it. I'm sure there's more. Uh, well, yeah, and I, I, I'd say what the thing is with, with, with him, dude, he's an integral part of the growth of mixed martial arts here in the Midwest. And, yeah. you know, the East and West coast guys might stick their nose up at it, but what he did was special. And if you look at his fight cards, I yeah. guarantee 
there's less than a handful of people that were able to pull off the fights like he did. Yeah, the undercards of his cards, even. Phenomenal. Like the you know, Chris Lytle versus Carl Parisian, you know? Yeah. That, that's a UFC fight, man. That's a, that's a, they, he, they were both probably could have beat guys in the UFC at the time, you know? I'm yeah. sure they could, you know? Uh, and, I, and I refereed it. Um, that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah, Derek Noble I, I, fought there. Yeah. Who's that? Derek Noble, another guy that fought on a current yeah. future UFC yeah. bet. Yeah. Yeah. The, all of them, man. You can't even, any anybody in the Midwest, you know, I was supposed to fight another guy on the, the uh, I've been hitting the head a lot. So my, <laughs> my, my, my recall on names is so bad that, you know, I know who people are, but, uh, um Forrest Griffin I was supposed to fight Forrest Griffin on that show and it didn't happen but I don't remember why maybe yeah, Chris Brennan fought Chris Brennan fought on it as well did Chris Brennan come out the same yes Louis? yes did he? he did yeah yeah and uh and uh also uh Shoney Carter yeah fought on it all the Miltich guys you know probably yeah. fought on it. and uh they were all always down there. And uh, I know Jeremy Horn fought Steve Berger. That was a pretty awesome fight on there. For sure. So. For sure. All right. Matt Ricehouse, he fought in Strike Force. He kind of got brought in as a sacrificial lamb for Ryan Couture. Right. Yeah. He was supposed to lose and he won that fight. And then he bought, he beat, he was 4 and 0 and then, um, and Strike Force. And then he fought, uh, Man, I wish I could pull it up. He he lost his last fight, but he was a one forty five pounder. Um, yeah, he beat Kocher, and then he beat um, Bill Cooper, Bill the Grill Cooper. Yeah, 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 on there. And those were his two contracted fights for Strike Force, I believe. And then uh, he fought. Um, I forgot the last name. The guy, the guy was ranked in the top ten in the world at one fifty five, and Matt walked in there weighing one fifty two. And it was a great fight, and then they dropped him, and then he quit fighting. Whenever you, whenever they, whenever they closed up Strike Force, um, they dropped him. But he was the, he probably was the best all around fighter I ever had as far as technics, technically. He, he lost to Bobby on, Green. Bobby Green, yeah, it was a decision to Bobby Green, and he walked in. He weighed in at one. He walked into the cage at one fifty two. That's crazy. And fought him, and I know Bobby Green was in the seventies. For sure. Yeah, Bobby Green just he had his retirement fight on the UFC. But Ryan Couture, there was like a big hype train behind him because he's Randy's son. They're showcasing him. Yeah. The clear B side that's just coming in to get, you know, job out, you know, they gave, gets the victory. They, like three not three names. They're like, hey, you can pick whoever you want to fight. And they picked Rice House. <laughs> and I remember we went up, it was in Seattle. It was in his kind of like their, their home area and and uh, we were waiting to fight. We were get, waiting to walk out. And this guy, he's like, hey, Rice House, Rice House. And, and Matt kind of looks over him and walks over a couple of feet. He goes, you're going to get your ass kicked. And, he, and Matt looks back at me and goes, oh, that's nice. He's such a mellow guy. And then he went out and he just, he uh, he won that handily, that fight. <laughs> so. I, I always kind of like it when the B-side comes in and, you know, the ticket seller, uh, you know, has a lot of issues. So a lot of explaining yeah. to do afterwards. Yeah. The other one was uh, Zach Freeman, and he fought uh, Aaron Pico on Bellator, uh -huh. and they brought him in. He fought. He fought on the main card on in Madison Square Garden on Bellator, and he submitted him in the first like thirty seconds. He dropped him with a he dropped him with a right hand, and then and then drop and then went straight to a guillotine and submitted him, and he was supposed uh -huh. to lose. Well, Pico, I mean, you had Freddie Roach actually have an intervention with Pico telling him you probably shouldn't do mixed martial arts because you could make a lot of money boxing. Yeah. You know, like when Freddie yeah. Roach has that conversation with you, I mean, you're you're probably on the way to a seven-figure contract at some point right. in your career. And uh, the jiu-jitsu and wrestling pedigree of Pico, obviously through the, through the roof. I think, to, I, to be brutally honest, after Pico – the developmental deals that they have with some of these guys, like a Grant Neal, a Lucas Brennan, I think they over, they corrected themselves. I think Pico, they hurt Pico. That loss, like, yeah. 
set him back a lot. They, they just chose bad because Zach was one of them guys that he didn't train much. He just had it. You know, he just was one of them guys that could just. Game. He's one of those guys that did that. He It doesn't matter. He was just natural. He didn't naturally fight. And he practiced probably two or three days a week. And then, but he's, re, you know, he, he had a regular job. He's retired actually pretty much, you know, and he's like, he's, he may have just turned 40, you know, but, you know, fighting was definitely number two on the list of things for him. He was, he was selling furniture to like mass to big co- corporations and okay, just not really his number one thing, but it was like a hobby. But he had his moment, you know, at that point he had his yeah. moment, man. And that's a yeah. big one. I mean, it was, it was a lot cool. of eyes. I mean, yeah. the whole country was talking about that fight afterward. Right. Yep. I mean, it was a hot topic for about a month. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, and neat and neat. And, and Zach just went back to practicing a couple of days a week. He didn't, he didn't try and cap. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like, uh, you know, Oh yeah. You know, I'm going to be a world-class fighter now, which he probably could have mm-hmm. been. He just went back to, you know, he had one more fight and he got knocked out, and then he just pretty much was like, oh, "I'm not, I'm good with not fighting anymore." Yeah, you yeah. know, he's got nothing to prove. Nothing yeah. to prove so. for sure. Um, you beat Travis Fulton, and then on December eighth, two thousand one, you fight for Brad Kohler in Ultimate Wrestling in a four man tournament. Yeah, let's start with Brad Kohler. Did you get paid for that I got fight? Paid. I did. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, it's we're and gonna he- call that a W. We're gonna call that a W. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't know Brad. Bro. I didn't know. You know, I remember watching him fight. He fought. You know, I remember watching him on the pay-per-views, but uh you know, there was there was some he had some pretty good people on that show. He had uh uh Debbie Purcell. Remember Debbie Purcell? Wars, dude. He had Mike he had a lot of Mike Riley's uh you know team bison, yeah. like Sam yeah. Morgan. Um Huas was there. Who one more time? Marco Huas. Oh, dude, who else? hundred percent, dude. Who else is? Yeah. Uh, who else was cornering? That was the Jens Pulver when Jens Pulver fought out there, correct? I don't remember who else fought. I know that mm-hmm. CJ Fernandez fought on that card. You remember CJ? I'm sure uh, you do. CJ Fernandez is like a like a Southern Illinois guy, heavy elbows, yeah. heavy yes. elbows. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So yeah, that was a that was a. There was a no rules fight. There was no rules in that fight on that show, Ultimate Wrestling. So there was, you know, you could punch elbow on the ground. You could do Rob Emerson the head. It was kind of like Pride rules. So Rob Emerson is the name that I was thinking of that um, that that fought Pulver. I think Emerson. You no, know, it was not on that that card. But I know for some reason who else had some sort of connection with Kohler. And would bring his guys out. And who else is like one of my heroes growing up? He yeah. was like someone that had everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was tough. He was nice when I met him too. So it was, yeah, that was a crazy show. You know, you fought and there was two rounds. And then after, I remember after this, I, I fought Greg Wicken. And after the two rounds, he's like, well, we don't, we, we don't know who's going to win. So you're going to have to go a third round, <laughs> you know? So then we did, did you do it from there. the cage or outside the cage. Uh, it was in a ring. Did he I go believe- in the ring and say this, or was it from the outside? He came in the ring and told us. Oh, yeah, you guys uh, on the microphone? I don't remember. I, yeah. no, he probably did. Yeah, he probably he told us yeah. individually, and then then did it on the microphone after that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It so was packed he, too. That place was packed. He he, he packed. did a good job. I mean, he. I mean, I've been to several of his events and did a good job. Not everybody got paid. But, you know, when the gate was good, they did. When they didn't, he, he's the promoter that famously faked a heart attack and had his own EMT crew take him out of the venue. I remember that. I remember hearing that story. Yeah, uh, Tra- Travis View was on that. When we interviewed Travis, we, we, he was the main event. And he's like, he got paid, but nobody else did. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. That was, a, that was the only night I... I, I fought twice that night. I guess I did that in the uh, in the Universal Challenge too, but that wasn't a very. It was more of a. That was lower level. All right. So George Allen out of Eagle MMA went by a dog. Somebody that fought everywhere. He's got quite a few fights, yeah. and then you, you went beat him, and then you also beat Greg Wicken. So it was a it was a good showing uh, yeah. on your end. 
George Allen fought. Uh, he still referees in Georgia, I believe. He's a. Does he really? Yeah, I believe he's a he's a referee. He he refereed one of the, my fighters down, and when I went down there, he was, you know, he came up and was the, you know, whenever did the the pre fight meetings, and I talked to him a little bit afterwards. How cool is that? That's yeah, cool. He trained it. He trained it. Uh, he trained with pro wrestlers a lot. He trained with uh, who's the guy that did the spike. <laughs> You talking about Bill Goldberg? Yeah, he trained with Goldberg. Yeah. Yep. Yes, he did. Yes, he yep. did. It, Bill Goldberg at one point with Obaki opened up, like was tantamount what the eight, uh, eight American Top Team is now. Like they opened it up. They brought in Mark Coleman. They brought in I, I think even Kerr trained there for a little bit. But just the demand wasn't there. But the facility was a multi million dollar facility. It was just too far ahead of its time. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't. I, I just knew he trained with them. I didn't know about this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very impressive. Um, after that, King of the Cage, J- Joey Gould, and then August 2nd, 2002, you fight a Lions Den, one of the original Lions Den members, Vernon Tiger White. Yeah. And that, uh, that was another, that was one of the fight I should have opened up and, and, uh, and threw more punches, but uh, I just didn't. And it, there was no, there was no sanctioning body. I, I, I made weight. I lost like 17 pounds that day. And then he came in and he was like three pounds over. And, uh, Terry Troublecock, is that the guy? that Yes. Owned, yes. The Chris Cordero was the matchmaker. Terry Troublecock was the owner. Yeah. And he's like, Oh, we'll just, that's all right. You guys just fight anyway. And so, which was, I mean, I wasn't going to not fight. So yeah. 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 Uh, it was a close decision. It was a, I think it was a split decision. I lost. So we interviewed Vernon Tiger White. And if you look at the beginning of his career, like his record, there's something to be said for his record in terms of like what it is. But when you look and see who's on it, it's incredible. Yeah. If you take the first half, like he was undefeated and then he got to, I think he fought in the UFC after I fought him. Yeah. He yeah. Time. Um, yeah, I think the first half of his career was much. Japan. You know, then he just started taking fights and probably not training after that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he he was like doing coke before fights. Like we in our interview, he admitted this. Like yeah. he's like he's fighting Matt Horwich. I was doing cocaine the night before. The smell of him was so bad. I just said to myself, "Man, this ain't fucking worth it. Fuck it. Let me get out of here." <laughs> <laughs> I remember so, Horwich too. Yeah. His words, not mine, just a, a quick synopsis of what he said. Um, yeah. And Vernon White, absolute legend, you know, one of the founding founders of, of Lion's Den. At this point, he was a much different Vernon White than he was later on in his career. Um, you know, we lose a split decision to him is something to be said. Yeah. Well, I would have liked to get the W. That would have been better. But at the time, I think King of the Cage would have been kind of like a Bellator now. Right. You know? Kind of like a, there was, you know, UFC and King of the Cage at the time with the two big. Do you think so? I don't know. I mean, I think for sure. I think for sure. In fact, I I would even like put my tinfoil hat on and say that for some reason, King of the Cage never wanted to compete with the UFC. They just kind of wanted to be the stepchild. And had they tried to compete with the UFC, Bellator probably wouldn't exist today. Yeah. Yeah. They were definitely the bigger, the next the next biggest show and they, and they had connections with uh, Japan and they'd send fighters over there. And then, and uh, Japan would send fighters over to, to King of the Cage. And I, I don't know, I think pride, wasn't it? It was Maybe pride. It was yeah. Because uh, rampage was on the same card as me. And then they sent rampage over to pride and then pride. Then he fought Shoji. Yeah. On yeah. On the same card as me. And yeah, uh, they also sent you know, Charles Bennett over to Japan where he made an incredible name for himself as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it was just different times, you know, even then there wasn't, even when I fought on that card, it wasn't really a big MMA.TV started coming in and then you started getting, you know, the, the underground forum, you know, was kind of a, the first thing that would, that got people to where fans could get together and talk about fights. You know, there was no like TV or, or, uh, television. There were no television shows or radio programs or anything that was, was geared towards MMA. And then I think the first thing that got 
got it big was that underground forum. Uh, yeah. you were on the underground forum, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, I was. I mean, everybody, everybody was. If you were in MMA, you had to be there. It's still there, isn't it? I think so. Yes, I, I know. I shouldn't say I think so. I know. So a lot of our our videos get posted over there, and people mention the underground forum in our comments yeah. on, on YouTube. Uh, it was a red peak back then, and that's how everybody got to know who who was fighting and what was going on. It was the underground forum? Yeah, Crowbar is somebody that has been there for years, and he posts our stuff over there all the time. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, Let's talk about Lance Benoist. You had him as a very young student, and you cornered him against Matt Riddle. Yeah, that was awesome. Okay, that was so B side, sacrificial I, lamb. You guys get the call. Yeah, and then he won by the night too. It, it was awesome, and he got. Uh, it was cool. It was down in New Orleans, and it was right after Katrina, and uh, Riddle comes out to rock you like a hurricane, which was kind of like. You know, I don't know if I don't know if uh, if it was if the people really liked that too much. You know, for <laughs> taste. Everybody, everybody, Trina had just ended, like uh, you know, it had just happened. You know, and and uh, but but Lance came out to House of the Rising Sun, which is a big. I know it's a big, it's a big song down in New Orleans. You know, they uh -huh. talk about this stuff on it. And it, it was crazy. The hands were over the side. It was. And he he fought his ass off. He was he was the best fighter we ever had. That he was better than Tyron. He he just didn't. His he had a twin brother that passed, and and that really set him back. And pretty much, and then he had some injuries, but he was unbelievable. He was he could fight his ass off. So he comes in as a sacrificial lamb, beats Matt Riddle. You know, and once again, St. Charles MMA plays the upset card. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I I. Uh, yeah, that was uh, that was that was that might have been that that up there with Sampo and uh, that was one of my favorite fights. Yeah, Alexis Vila and Banuelos. I mean, Sampo was the underdog yeah. there in both of those yeah. fights. And, yeah. and, and, and talk about mindset. Like these fighters, it's not like it's a surprise to them that they're the B side and the underdog. They know that going in, and there there has to be some sort of mental leveling up that you as a coach I, I, have to provide them. You know, and then, and if you watch, you can watch the fight. You know that you can win that fight. You know, so, and then there's no pressure on you to win the fight. It's not like you're supposed to win it. So, you know, the, all these fights that we were the B card. Like I knew that Matt Rice House could beat Coach. Rea. You know, I was like, yeah, we'll take that fight for sure. I knew, I knew that Lance could beat Riddle. I didn't think that Riddle would. I didn't think Riddle had a chance versus Lance. And uh, the one that uh, I knew Zach could beat pico um that was the one that i was the most nervous that i thought would be the hardest one out of i thought for sure rice house would win i for sure thought for sure lance would win and zach i didn't know because i there was no film on pico just what people said about him you know there wasn't any but i knew zach could win fights for sure right right yeah um after vernon white you go back you fight alex stiebling i was actually at this fight as well of yours, Alex Stiebling, the Brazilian killer. Yeah, the great uh, killer or whatever. Yeah, that was another one I should have. I, I, you know, didn't let my hands go, and you know, got it went to decision and pretty uneventful fight, I believe. Um, Goker I was in the audience. Carol was in the audience. Sean yeah. Shirk was there. Matt Hughes was there. I mean, it was like a who's who in the audience that night. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. There were every fight show was like that. You know, it wasn't like. Uh, Do you remember the little people serving drinks? No, I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah, he, Rand, Randy had that as well. That's yeah. that's the kind of guy. Rand, Randy, you know, spared no expenses. He was he was great. He was great. You know, you know, uh, he was. Uh, yeah, that, that was a bummer. You know what happened to him because he was nice. To, he was he really was nice to everybody. You know, he treated all the fighters. With respect, he, when they talk, when they when you hear about his reputation from the law enforcement side, being this just giant supplier of things for people within the biker community, yeah, it's just his personality didn't match up because he was such a nice guy. It's not like, yeah. all right, go get the hammer. We're going to start with your fingers and move up your body. Like he wasn't that guy. No, he was just, you know, he lived in a little house in, in South St. Louis. You know where the 
most of the time in St. Louis, let's be honest, you don't, it, it's hard to get in trouble in St. Louis city. You know, they, they're busy with all, it, it's been the murder capital of the United States for yeah, 30, you know, well, I'm from Chicago and yeah. you know, I, I like the competition between us and yourself in regards to that statistic. Per capita, <laughs> we're way ahead. It's not even close. Yeah. It makes me per jealous. Capital. It makes me jealous. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't even think I, but I don't think I'd be safe going downtown to Chicago right now, you know, you know, you know, truth be told, it's, it's such a shame because the people in charge and, you know, we, I'm being, you know, joke, I'm joking when I'm talking about something so tragic, but the people in charge, they don't do anything to correct it. It's a problem that's been happening right. for, for three decades. Right. It's been happening for three decades yeah. and it's just passing the buck, passing the buck and nothing ever changes. Yeah, so I try not to even go to down. I try not to go to St. Louis too much. I mean, it's hard not to. There's so many cool things down there. My kids want to go to, but you know, you always got to have your head on the swivel. Well, anyway, it worked out for Randy because you know they're they're so busy with other stuff, and he was kind of a low key guy. You know, he wasn't out flashing fancy cars, and or you know, he had you know drove us to regular cars and had a little bitty house. You know, hung out at the Bean House. You know on uh, Lee May Ferry, you know, it wasn't like he was a, it wasn't like he was out there, you know, flashy, yeah, flashing, flashing the police, like, Hey, look what I got, you know? And so, you know, I don't know how they, you know, he never did go to jail for anything. I don't know. So, you know, he wasn't in a, in, so yeah, he was something else. Yeah, no, that's not. He had all the fighters at his shows. He filmed them. He, you know, he, you know, he was ahead of his time on that. You know, and yeah. and he was a fan, so he just brought in, like you said, the people that he wanted to see fight. He didn't care about that. He just wanted the fights that. Well, the fights that he wanted to see fight, everybody wanted to see fight. You know, everybody wanted to see. Yeah, I remember like talking to him, like, you know, what about who us? What do we gotta do to get him to your show? I'm like trying to convince him, like. Yeah. I know you like your guys, but I like my guys too. I just don't have the money. You know, can we bring yeah. this guy in? <laughs> that guy yeah. In. <laughs> yeah, he was, uh, you know, he, yeah. Like you said, you know, if Lytle, Car uh, Caro, um, you know, that, that those two guys right there, you know, that's an unbelievable fight on a little bit, of, on a little regional show. So. Yeah. In uh, 2004, February, you joined On Demand Fight Team with Alex Caparici. Yeah. That's kind of a, a, a big move on your end. He opened up, uh, a, he got you and Steve Contracts on Rumble on the Rock, May 7th, 2004, where you fight uh, Jason Lambert. Yeah. Future, future uh, UC vet. Yeah, I, I didn't even have a chance in that fight. I didn't really train and train very hard, and he just, and he was just outmanaged me totally. So, um, you know, that, that, and you know, it was a 13, it, nothing went right. <laughs> nothing went right on that. You know, I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't fo mentally focused to fight. And, uh, I also, I didn't train and he was better than me. So all those three things probably, you know, it wasn't the best night for me. <laughs> well, and, 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 you know, Jason Lambert beats Babalu makes, you know, goes to the UFC like Jason Lambert. Yeah. I, I think if he can subtract injuries from his career, that guy's winning a world title. Like he was legit. Yeah. yeah, he was good, man. And he, uh, he was definitely stronger than me. He was so, and I didn't even make weight. I didn't make weight for that fight. Oh, I, nothing. Yeah. It's an embarrassing thing. I can't believe you brought that up. <laughs> is, this, is this one of those edits we were talking about earlier? <laughs> no, we don't even. Okay, but uh, yeah, yeah, that was uh, and Richard Chow was the matchmaker for that. You know, who went on to, you know, I think I believe that was, uh, yeah, he was he was the one that ran that show. Yes, yes, and at this point, you're a blue belt in, uh, under Vagi, and. You grapple in the first off. I thought Bad Breed uh, was a super cool, you know. Uh, I, I guess it was kind of like a fanzine, but on DVD. And you enter into the grappling Bad Breed grappling tournament, where you go up against Dustin Ware, Mike Pat, and you wind up in the finals with Jeff Monson as a blue belt. Oh yeah, yep, yeah. And I, I lost in overtime to Monson. Oh. And then uh, think he, about that. He got me in a headlock and and uh, it was zero zero I believe and then he he put me in a headlock and and uh, tried to squeeze 
the brains out of my ears started when I felt them coming out of my ears, I, I tapped. <laughs> so, and then, but then he, uh, we, then we did another match in the same show. They did another whole tournament and I matched, uh, um, who he was in the UFC. He's the UFC champion. Uh, he lost to, uh, see, I told you I've been hit too many times. It's Enrico Rodriguez. No, no. After that, he was, he was, uh, I can't. Anyway, Josh, I was with, Josh Barnett. No, nope. Okay, keep going. Go ahead. He's from Vegas, and UFC champion. Oh, Frank Mir. Yeah, Frank Mir. Yeah, Frank Mir. Frank Mir. Yeah. And then I was I was beating Frank Mir by like seven or eight points, and then he 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 got me in a Kimura and, and nearly broke my arm off, and then he beat Munson. So we did like a second one after that, and uh, I also matched Dan Lambert in that who owns that American top team. Okay. Yeah. So I matched him there as well. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, that, that, so there, there's a lot of people in that one, but Lan, yeah. Lan, uh, yeah. Mon and Monson was a character. He was uh, super ADCC. Funny. I mean, ADCC champion at this point, yeah. you take him in overtime. Talk, he's like, he sees me across the room. He will like, Mike, he'll, he'll, he was the nicest guy that I ever met. Did, uh, were you in, in 2006 of March of 2006, were you at the Gracie Arnold's? I'm almost positive. I saw you there where Jeff had his protest with Patapano. I believe so. I don't, he, but he was, yeah, ripping I was speakers. there, but I don't, yeah, I remember I was there. Yeah. I pulling down speakers, got down to his underwear. Yeah. <laughs> I forget, he is a nut, man. <laughs> I don't. I, I wasn't involved in that, so I don't really. I do remember it, but I wasn't like intric intricately involved in that. So I, I was there with my my former wife, and uh, I remember her just being in awe, just like and and she would tell everybody, this guy was built like a gorilla. He was huge, and he may have had the smallest penis I have ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. Yeah, I, don't know. I didn't. I don't think I. What I would have remembered that maybe I wasn't there. Maybe I just... she, would, she would say, "Come on, vouch for me." Like hit my arm. Tell him, <laughs> tell him it was small. And I'm like, "Man, I, I did see it, and it, it definitely was. Uh, it was just man, maybe probably was not just something. I, but it's something I'd show off. <laughs> maybe it's just not like comparable to the rest of his body. But like, no, if you, no, there was oh, problems there. There was problems there. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, and we've had Jeff Monson probably... on. And he mentioned it as well. He fully went into it with our interview with Jeff Motz in our interview with him. Who did? Jeff. Oh. Yeah. The, I, I, I would have remembered that. So, yeah, I, I probably wasn't. I might have been in that tournament and <laughs> had left the building or something. But Peter Pottle, that's a guy who I, I forgot his name for the longest time, too. I haven't heard his name in the longest time. Now, Munson told me after our match, he goes, look, I tell you what you do, you come down to Florida you, and you move in with me. I'll get you on steroids, and we'll do, and I'll show you how to do it all. And then you will lose to nobody. You won't lose to anybody. So I didn't take him up on it, but so in a, in, a, in, a, in a interview with Dennis Hallman at the very end of the interview, he said, in order to beat a steroid test, Jeff would shoot other people's urine into his body to pass a urine test. I could see him doing that. He was crazy, man. I saw Ed Clay. We went and stayed at Ed Clay's house. You know Ed? Of course. Yeah. Joe Rogan mentions him occasionally. He's got a yeah. uh, Ibogaine treatment center in Mexico. Right. So uh, I haven't talked to him in the longest time, but we'd go down there and st that was who did that. That's who did that tournament with Jeff Monson and that you just mentioned that we were in. And we stayed, me and Steve Berger and Jeff Monson. And I believe or maybe a couple of other guys all stayed in Ed Clay's house when we went down there and Ed Clay took uh, Jeff Munson's toothbrush and rubbed it on his nuts in front of all of us and then put it back there. And then Munson brushed his teeth and then Ed's like, ah, I got you. And he's making fun of him. And Jeff's like, yeah, I guess you got me, you know, and did, he, he thought it was funny too. And I, I was like, man, if you would rub my, your nuts on my toothbrush, I'd be fighting you right now. Okay. Not to care one bit. Like it didn't. No. Even okay. So in our interview with Dennis Hallman, he talks about sneaking in at night, 
taking the car seat. Oh, no, no, no. Going to Jeff's work, stealing his car seat. And Jeff, like, confirmed it. He's like, yeah, I had to go to the garbage. Uh, I found bags of leaves to sit on so I could drive my car home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He told me about that, too. He told me Dennis Hallman went to his house when he was at practice and took all of his all of his uh, um, furniture out of his house and put it on his roof and set it up like it was his living room on his roof. Including the cats. Including the cats. You heard about that then, too. I, well, Jeff told us about it. He told yeah, us about he, it, yeah. I'm home and my whole my whole living room sets on the roof, set up so, like it's just set up like just like it's uh, it's his living room on the roof. Like that would be so, <laughs> so, so Jeff, we got a two and a half hour interview with Jeff where he's in Russia, so it's like midnight, and his wife is telling him to shut up because he's waking the house up, and you know he's got small kids, and I'd say for a good hour, it was like a therapy session of him talking about the things Dennis Hallman did to him. And at the yeah. end, he's just like, yeah, I really miss that guy. You know, it caused him a divorce. Dennis for sure caused a divorce in Jeff's life. Yeah. <laughs> and he just doesn't care. Doesn't Dennis, care. Yeah. Well, no, he just, you know, he just rolls with it. It seems like he just rolls with it. <laughs> Something happens, you know, well, I'll figure it out. We'll roll with it. He got the tattoo on his neck of some girl's name and when he was out of town and then he had to go back home to his wife. And so he made a big black tattoo on his back to cover it up. I don't right. know if he's right. he you also know. would, he would also, but yeah, this is out of his mouth in our interview. He said yeah. that he would have postcards that uh, he would give to people that were going out of town to mail to his wife to prove he was there when he'd go out with other women. Yeah. He was something else, you know, <laughs> He told me all kinds of stories. I mean, I don't remember them all, but, you know, and these are just my time with him is very little, you know, like I, I we spent the weekend at Ed Clay's and then I'd see him at tournaments, you know, and he'd come up and say hi or whatever. But that guy's nice. He's super nice. For being as wild and crazy, he is super nice. He and certainly he, doesn't mind being on the receiving end of a joke, for sure. No, no not at all. Yeah. Yeah, I was definitely a fan of his. Although he, he uh, you know, yeah, he was a good guy. He yeah, is a good for, guy. You, you wrap your career up with a fight in Canada against Lance Cartwright. Steve Berger, your buddy, fought Fritz Paul. Um, shortly after that, on the 2006 of March, you received your brown belt after uh, competing at that Arnold's tournament, I believe, from uh, from Vagi. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's when I got it. And that, then, uh, go ahead. in Canada, when I, in that fight, I broke my jaw. Yeah. And, and they're like, it's crazy. Cause you know, at the time I was a school teacher still, and I had health insurance. So I was like, Oh man, at least I'll be covered for health. I went, it's in Canada. So they're like, yeah, you're out of luck. My jaw, my jaw was broke. It was broke from in two places. I guess it always breaks in two places. It was hanging down. And, uh, and I went to the I went to the emergency room and they're like, oh yeah, you're out of luck. Here, here's four pills to get you home. They gave me four uh, pain pills, and then I didn't have a ride. I had to walk like in Montreal. I was in Montreal. I had to walk like five miles. And you in Montreal, you can just see the there's a they had the Olympics there, so uh, there's a big building that you can see from far away. And I'm like, that's the direction I need to go. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't. It was before cell phones. I I'm, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I doubt. I don't think I had a cell phone because it was in Canada. Right. You so don't want to get the roaming charges. The roaming charges would have murdered you. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I was. I had to walk. You know, my only. I was in some some shitty emergency room. You know, no one came back to get me or anything, and I. So I had to walk back to the hotel. And I could find the hotel because I, you could see the, the outline of uh, of the Olympic thing in the Montreal you know, whatever the building was. So, you know, I just walked back with this broken jaw and had to fly home like that. That sucked. Well, it sucked, but it probably helped you just determine, yeah, I think I'm done with this. It's it's time to teach full-time. This is it. Well, <laughs> this is it. truthfully, you know, I, I never was full-time. I never was full-time into training or anything because it was, wasn't, you know, there was not, it just wasn't a thing, you know, back then it was more, it was just like high school wrestling to me. It was just something to do. 
you know, as a fighter. And then, you know, I opened a gym because, you know, I like being around the guys more than anything else. I like being at the gym with the guys and training. Um, you know, that's why I opened the gym. It wasn't because I have a, this is the, I like the camaraderie more than I like the sport. I like the people, you know, the, the guys at the gym. So that's why I opened the gym. It was, you know, the competition for me was, was fun too, but it wasn't like, I was never took it. I never took it serious enough to, you know, like if I, like, if I looking back and how big it was going to get, I, I, you know, you had no idea it was going to get this. You no. Know, you know, back then it was just, it was a dirty uh, secret. It was a dirty secret back then. Yeah didn't even know if it was going to be legal you know in a couple of years because you had senators trying to make it illegal you know so it With was the just- campaign and and budweiser actually had a campaign like people are kind of dumping on bud light right now budweiser anheuser bush actually helped fund some of the lobbyists in order to block mixed martial arts from becoming legal so there was huge money behind huh. stopping it huh yeah i didn't know that yeah, so, but yeah, I guess it was probably for them to do that. It would had be something to do with them, John McCain, or yeah, and John McCain, yeah. Oh, well, John McCain probably too, or something. I don't know. Yeah, it, I mean, I, it wasn't that serious for me back then, you know. Like I liked training and I liked being around the guys, and uh, you know, it was just a natural progression from college wrestling and and. uh so I think that was, you know, why I did it. I, I would say that, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not the, uh, you know, I would love to get more guys in the UFC. I'm not done. I'm, I'm going to keep going. But, you know, I also have wife and kids. And, you know, right now I got a great group of, of amateur and, and young pro fighters that and some of them have a good chance of making it. So well, I, I do color commentary for Ignite Fights with Jeremy Bjornberg, who, Oh yeah, we're gonna have you, we're gonna be up there June second. Right, right. Oh, you're gonna be up in Chicago. Are you coming? Yes, dude. I'm gonna request a picture with you, man. Like oh, I've, I want a picture with you. <laughs> but man, that's what yeah. I'm talking about. So yeah. like I've seen you fight live, you know, quite a few times, and I've always admired your work. And whenever your guys fight for us, I always bring up your history during their fights. So it's super important that people understand that. I appreciate that, man. I, I don't really feel like I, I'm not. I wouldn't. I, I didn't do all the stuff that some of these other guys did, but I was around. I was here. Hey, dude, you fought the NHB or you fought the headbutts, yeah. you know what yeah. I mean? Yep. Yeah. That's it. it. So you also refereed uh, occasionally uh, on March 24, 2007, MMA Genesis in St. Charles, Missouri. Ryan Antle and James Wade fought. Does that fight stand out to you at all? Yeah, that's uh, what's that guy's name? He hit me after uh, the fight. <laughs> Joe what, Jordan. What's his name? Joe Jordan. Joe Jordan. Yeah. So I, uh, they're like, this is right when they're gonna, about ready to make pro legal. And the guy uh, that's run the show is like, hey, we got state representatives in the in the crowd, and we're gonna, you know, make sure it's not too gory. And the, the, anyway, this guy was taking punches, and I stopped it. In which, wh- whether it was early or not, I don't remember, but. I came back and I was actually cornering. I I was referee in that fight and and uh, Robbie Lawler was the other referee, so he was refereeing when I was cor- when I was cornering, and uh, I was cornering Tyron. And Joe Jordan comes up and he hits me. He hit me. He's like, you know that guy. You stopped it because you're friends with him. I'm like, yeah, that guy was he actually. I did know him, but I didn't stop it for that reason. I mean, he was actually. He went to a gym that was five miles. His his gym was five miles from my gym. You know, him winning a fight wouldn't, you know, at the time it, it you know, it hurt you more than it would help. Yeah, he's my competitor. Anyway, he hit me. He hit me, and the whole left, left. He hit me on one side, and the other side of my body went completely numb, and I could could not move my. I was like, I'm gonna kill this little bastard, you know, in my mind, but I couldn't move, and in the front of my face, one of my, one of my fighters named uh, John Menke came across and he tackled, he threw Joe Jordan on the ground and he was stomping him, stomping on him. And by the time that I woke up, you know, I didn't fall down. I started kicking him too. And then the cops, the police were coming 
And I think uh, by the time the police got there, all three of us stood up and he's like, they're like, what happened? And all three of us like, nothing, nothing happened. And then that was it. <laughs> so I was there. I was actually there for that. And if, if I may, <laughs> yeah, I was there. I, I mean, I, I was there after you got sucker punched, but I was there and saw the actual fight and what took place. And it was probably over. Right. Wait, I'm sorry. You broke up. I, my recollection, recollection. I mean, you, it, from my opinion, like in, I'm, I'm sober. I was sober then as well. Yeah. I mean, you as well, you're refereeing. But yeah. from what I recall, there was about a dozen unanswered punches with, uh, you know, the MFS guy against the cage. And um, like what oh, we yeah. were told. I, I thought you were, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's why you stopped it. So, and, yeah. and like everybody was cool with it except the corner, which was Joe Jordan. And Joe Jordan, like his kid right now, I think is number one in the entire country. He's a top college recruit. Um, like Joe Jordan's kid's a freaking savage. And um, like I, I was told that it was a sucker punch. He hit me with the heel. He hit me with the palm of his of his of his of his hand you know, like this, that's what it seemed like to me. Uh, I thought you, I thought you, when you said you saw it, you were back in the back and you saw it. In the no, back. I was at, I, I was, was at the event. Yeah. You know, I was like, I want you know, yeah. Yeah. He hit me. I didn't know he was going to hit me. Uh, and uh, I just remember I was, if he would have hit me again, I would have for sure went down. You know, he hit, he didn't hit me twice. The other guy, my, my fighter jumped him. Tyron just stood there and watched it. You know, he was fighting. So we all, and, and the police got there. Uh, I believe Joe said nothing happened. I said nothing happened. And John said nothing happened. And then I walked out and cornered Tyron. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> that was it. You know, it wasn't like, uh, you know, and then that was the last I ever heard of it, I believe. I mean, I think there was something on the underground about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. Steve Burke challenged him to fight afterwards. Yeah. The MFS guys at this point, they, they, they were kind of known for being a little bit of bullies, truth yeah. be told, at this yeah. time. Yeah. They had, their, they had their reputation. Yeah. Well, it was, it all worked out. You know, I wasn't hurt. You know, I didn't leave me, it didn't leave anything on my face or anything. And, and uh, I think he probably took the worst of it, you know. Yeah. There's, from there's two, one of him, you know. So, yeah. Wild. Um, I mean, do you, Go ahead. Water under the bridge. I don't really. No, care it, 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 dude, it's, it is what it is. I mean, that's, that's life, you know, that, but that's 20, that really is. That's uh, 15 years ago, probably now. Yeah, I think it was in two, 2007. Yeah. yeah. So it's been a while. Um, do you remember the promoter Skip Olson? Yeah. Yeah. Skip's in jail. <laughs> yes. Skip's in jail. Yes. He was, yeah. Yes. That's a funny story. My, 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 one of my best friends and yeah. You know, he's as good of a friend as I got named Mike Garrett was selling tickets for him. And uh and so he had a relationship with him. This and uh so Skip, I guess, had some you know, he had some bad dealings with a lot of people and he was getting divorced and his and so he had a hit list. Like these are the people he's gonna kill. So he had A, B, C, D on levels. You know, so level A was his wife's lawyer and so-and-so and so-and-so. Level B was so – and my friend Mike was like level C, like on this on this group of people he was going to kill. And uh, he tried to blow up his his wife's lawyer's car, put a uh, – he put a bomb under it, and it wasn't his wife's lawyer. It was a different guy. He put it underneath the wrong wrong car. And it was in downtown Clayton, which is kind of like a city inside of St. Louis County. And uh, he blew up the wrong car, and then I guess he got caught. And I didn't have, I didn't really deal with him too much, just a little bit, you know, because he was he was a promoter and matchmaker, so he wanted to put guys on the card. And and I believe he asked me to referee too. And then he got the big name Robbie Lawler to. to uh, that's another Midwest guy from the early days that actually really crushed it. Who's a great guy. You know, Matt is Robbie Lawler. Yeah. So I, I, I love talking about shady, shitty promoters because they don't get they don't get the attention that they deserve. Yeah. They yeah. really don't. I, I think he got his I think he got his money from his wife's family too. I, I don't really know them at all, but that was the story. So 
he uh, also like everything unraveled with him, you know, prior to that taking place, he also had a, uh, a bunch of like, he would, you know, buy houses, you know, the predatory loans from, from banks and then just kind of stiff everybody and use different names and aliases. He had, I mean, he had his hand in everything. He really did. Yeah. I, I you know, yeah, I, I'm sure he, you know, he's in, he's right. He's sitting in jail for, I don't know how much longer he's going to be in jail, but. I never had a bad dealing with the guy. I can't really say anything bad about him personally. You make his, you didn't make his list. <laughs> I know I didn't make his list. Thank God, I didn't want to be on that list. So nothing like <laughs> documenting, you know, something you already know you're going to do. But let's just, you know, make evidence against ourselves. <laughs> right. If I want to be on the list, I would definitely want to be on D or F. Or right. E. Right. That's He's not like getting away with three of them. <laughs> right. Yeah. My friend was like, "Thank God, I was way down on the list," you know. <laughs> to get on the on the murder list, yeah, can I get a can I get a copy of that? I'd like to put it on my wall. I mean, it's right. good com- yeah. good conversation piece. He got a, he got a he actually got a visit from the FBI. Like, hey, we're just we don't want to alarm you, but you're on a list to be murdered. <laughs> so, but uh, you know, but the good news is you're you're way down on that list. So, and he's already been caught. So. <laughs> So. Good, good news and bad news, right? Yeah. Um, let's talk about some of your, your your beginning teammates. Brazilian Mike Rothmeyer. Mike Rothmeyer, yeah, he uh, he has his own gym now in Belleville, Illinois, and he just straight to it's only no. And he's another guy that he fought MMA, but he didn't do MMA. He just did jujitsu. You know, yeah, was it wasn't for him? Tyler Bishop. Tyler Bishop is not my student. He is actually. Can you guys work out together though? No. Well, he's from JW's gym, which is right on the street from me. And, and his uh, wife is uh, currently fighting on Bellator. Uh, Jenna French. Is that Jenna? Jenna. She's mm-hmm. a beast. He can probably fuck his ass. He's a nice guy though. Yeah. I didn't, I, he's not. <laughs> so uh, in 2013, and we're going to wrap up with this. Um, in 2000, I answered maybe 2010 to 2015, the satellite academies became very popular um, in regards to uh, selling of, of black belts. And yeah. uh, Justin Morris was somebody that uh, was in the St. Louis area doing it. Justin, do, you, do you remember him? Justin, was his name Justin Morris? Justin something else. Justin, uh, was it Morris? Justin. I don't want to get this wrong because he, he did some real shady stuff and I don't want to say it. It wasn't Justin Morris though. It was Justin. Uh, it was a different Justin. Anyway, he, he got just, it wasn't Justin Morris. Whoever Justin Morris is, is okay. not, not who I'm talking about. It's Justin. Uh, it's another Justin, but yeah, uh, I got, I was really talking trash on him, you know, but uh, he, he ended up getting in trouble for, you know, for, uh, being a pedophile so you know but it wasn't justin morris it was a different his last, that's not his last name it's Justin. okay about. yeah what were you got what were you thinking about well you? they were selling they were he, they, they would sell black belts like you don't even yeah. have to show up over here just pay me once a month tell me you're doing you know the work and then yeah. i'll promote you accordingly and we don't ever have to meet right yeah <laughs> yep it was on i mean i don't know if that's I just remember this guy being, it was called Anaconda MMA. Mm-hmm. And that, that was the gym it was out of. And uh, I remember him just getting brown belt. And I was just like, what is going on? Because at the time, you know, I didn't realize that, that people were doing that kind of thing in Brazil because it was such a big deal to get that black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Why would you give it away so easy? Because it's so hard to get, you know. You know, at the time, there was very few American black belts. You know, so I was just like, my God, why, who is this guy that's giving away black belts? It, to, it just didn't make sense to me. And I, and I was younger, so it pissed me off a little more than, like, now it wouldn't bug me at all. You laugh you know, at it now. Right. Well, you know, it's just so kind of the way it, it's just normal, normalized, you know, people, and they get out themselves, you know, they don't really, you know, there's a lot of good gems now. There, even in St. Charles, there's a lot of good Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gems. So, hmm. And um, in 
January of 2009, you became Rodrigo Vagni's first black belt. What an honor. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, it, it was, uh, you know, and, and uh, there's another guy named Todd Fox who probably should have got out at the same time as me. And, and since then, we've been promoted pretty much at the same time. That's I mentioned him earlier. He's he's a great guy. Um, but, yeah, it's, it was a great. It's a great honor to be a Rodrigo's black belt. Yeah, the first, the first. Yeah. So, Mike Rogers, we sincerely appreciate you get you coming on as well as I mean, it's, you know, historically speaking, you're, you know, somebody that's been around quite a few blocks and you know, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And, it, and it's been a lot of fun. I haven't thought about a lot of this stuff since I haven't heard, thought of Jeff Jordan in probably 10 years, you know, <laughs> I haven't thought about uh, some of the stuff with uh, that you talked about in a long time. So I haven't thought about my fights at all. Uh, it's been so long ago and I've, you know, focused on these other kids fighting, you know, uh, I really appreciate you having me on. It's been it's been great. Maybe feel good. Yeah. yeah. Hey, June second, Burr Ridge at Compass Arena. You can see this gentleman with his uh, his fight team, Mike Rogers. I'll see you there, man. Thank you so I'll much. See you for a month. Have a good yeah. day. Take care. Bye -bye. You too, brother. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.